Um, okay, next we move on to open science and the role of innovation and data storage with Filecoin's Danny O'Brien. Now, the open science movement calls for greater access to scientific data sets for research and public use. But radical openness demands robust data infrastructure to help preserve and share mass information. All sounds very interesting. Welcome to the stage, Danny. Thank you. <laughs> ah, we have enough seats. Excellent. Take a seat. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thanks everyone here for coming. This is one of the larger panels, but I think it's literally planet spanning. Um, we have folks here from the very uh, forefront of open science, um, uh, from both NASA, CERN, and also folks working on taking these large data and actually uh, large uh, amounts of data and actually distributing them uh, use, using Filecoin, using our own uh, uh, system. So I'm just going to do a really interest, uh, quick introduction. Uh, Sonia, uh, you're, uh, you work at CERN uh, on these kind of big data, uh, big data projects, and also uh, how to reproduce the experiments that you're doing. Um, Zach, you're working uh, with Greg on uh, large data projects, um, including uh, Atlas mm -hmm. at, um, at, at, at CERN. Uh, we have uh, Megan, who is here, uh, wearing a lot of hats in planetary science and NASA, but you're speaking in your own uh, uh, a role as uh, not only an advocate, but a user of open science. And uh, Greg, Greg is uh, with Picnic, who are one of the larger storage providers on the Filecoin network. So, okay, we banged through all the introductions. <laughs> Let me get to the, the nitty gritty. Um, uh, you're all playing a part in open science, but how would you describe open science and what, what, what is its benefit both for the disciplines and the organizations that you work within and for the progress of, of science as a whole? Not, not an easy question, but I'll let you rotate through. Greg, do you want to start? What, do, how, what does open science mean for you? Sure. Um, uh, for me, um, so I'm, I'm a degreed mechanical engineer. I spent the first 20 years of my career building scientific instruments. So I was more on the kind of data creation side of things. And I'm um, very honored to say that I was part of the James Webb Space Telescope project and really excited to see that telescope up at L2, snapping some amazing images. And it's just all about getting um, information out to the world and, and letting folks uh, in, you know, in tough situations in tough corners of the world um, have the advantage of, of seeing this amazing data and doing something very exciting with it and learning. Uh, I think science is an extremely important thing. Uh, a common theme through my career, uh, starting at Johns Hopkins and now uh, working at Picnic, um, has been getting information and science and knowledge out to the world. And um, so I see the game I'm playing now is even on a much bigger scale, where literally you know, storing data and getting it to the corners of the world. And I just love being part of this decentralized network and working with amazing people like uh, Megan, Zach, and Zunia. And so I, I just think that we're I don't know, we're, we're going to have a huge effect on, on many people in the world that right now don't have access to such data. Thank you. Megan, you have a planetary span. Um, is open science something that, that helps um, uh, drive, well, to pick a particular example, like exoplanetary study, which you've been involved in, um, is it something that really can take place um, outside of an institution like NASA? Yeah, I think so. Um, and we have a lot of, even at NASA, we fund a lot of um, citizen science. Right. Um, so making the data publicly available, you know, so that everyday people can participate in the scientific process, I think is really important. Um, the other thing that's really important, I think, with open science is that it, it creates a more equitable environment. So it really breaks down right. barriers for, you know, communities that um, typically have been marginalized or excluded from the scientific process. So I think that's really important as well. Um, and then just, you know, Working at NASA, it's a government agency. We get funded with taxpayer dollars, right? We have an obligation to make right. <laughs> to make the data publicly available as well. Right. Yeah. Zach, has open science been part of your life? Absolutely. So the experiment that I work on at CERN is called ATLAS. It's one of the, the biggest experiments on Earth. There are 5,000 scientists. And um, getting the data out to the public, as Megan says, it's, it's owned by the public. It's publicly funded research. So it's your data. We need to make sure that it's, it's available to everyone. Um, and there's another community. We're sort of the experimental community. And there's a group uh, that's of 
theorists, people building models that really want to look at our data and see what it, what it looks like. So getting the data out to them in a way that they can understand it and use it and help it uh, help with it is, is really important. And again, you know, just things like citizen science, uh, opening up our science to the world has been really important. And I mean, just to be clear, because you're talking about opening this data, but how much data are you dealing with when you're talking yeah. about this? So think of Atlas as a camera taking pictures of particle collisions. So uh, the next data set that we'll open this year will be five billion pictures of about 100 billion collisions, uh, which will take some petabytes of disk space to store. So already we're at a scale where we can't just give people a link on a website to download the data here, right? You, you in immediately encounter those sorts of uh, equity and equitability issues where you know, if only a few people in the world can afford the disk space to store these data, then we have a problem. And things like Filecoin can be a, a solution for those sorts of issues. So Sunia, out of everybody, everybody here is sort of effectively an advocate for, for open data. But I mean, I think you've spent a lot of your time really advocating and thinking about this. Has this sort of re relatively recent change in the focus of science into these big data projects uh, made it more challenging to open up uh, science? Uh, I don't think so, actually, um, because um, open science is not necessarily a technical challenge. It's more of a cultural change. Um, so I think um, it's fairly scalable from, you know, any kind of small lab experiment, citizen science project to, you know, what Zach was just talking about. So, um, yeah, I think um, even more than ever, uh, we need to do it. So. Right, right. I mean, I think going, dr drilling to, to one of the things that we were talking about, so I know that one of the areas that you work in a lot is, is reproducibility. And yes, pe people, it's key. Yeah. Yeah, and people talk about a reproducibility crisis in science, right? Yeah, for good, very good reasons, because, I mean, there have been, unfortunately, quite a few people out there in some disciplines, um, you know, who have not been, who have been cheating or have not been able to, um, to show that uh, their results were based on, you know, data or real software or whatsoever. So right. that's why we need to um, tackle this very, and take this very seriously. But um, open science in the end, I mean, it's a brand, of course, a very important one, but, um, you know, one could also say fair science, responsible science, trustworthy science, it all goes in the same direction. And that means, um, you know, you read the news um, with X, Y research result, um, and, um, you know, you're able to follow this up if you're interested. You can check the data, you can check the code behind. Um, I mean, that would be the, the real world, um, as we would love it to be, I think, because um, at the moment, with so much misinformation around, um, you know, there are solutions <laughs> to right, this. Right, right. Um, and again, they're not technical because, I mean, you know, linking to results, um, you know, keeping the data safe, um, you know, all, all this is possible. Can, can I take a quick straw poll? Because when I read a scientific uh, article, an article covering our, uh, uh, um, these, these discoveries, and there isn't a link to the original yeah. project, I go crazy. Okay, so we all agree that yeah, that's okay. <laughs> so where's the camera? So presumably, <laughs> someone in CNBC and the media is going to be watching this. Like, put links, put links at the bottom of that. Okay, good. All right. So one of the <laughs> other parts of this for me is re so uh, with my Filecoin hat on, and this this will be a thread going through this. When I talk to scientists, and we have this exabyte level, uh, fairly cheap uh, storage system. Um, and I talk, and it's fascinating because the end product of science right now is the paper, right? <laughs> but 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 paper a paper cannot hold this science, and these intermediate steps seem to get lost. Is that is that as you say a cultural challenge or is that a technical challenge? Um, both, I would say, um, because the publishing industry. Um, I'm sorry if I. <laughs> Um, <laughs> we'll look to that category. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they're has watching. It's little, okay. You can has, say has what you want. It's been a little slow, you know, in taking up uh, like more modern <laughs> technologies. <laughs> so, and has been fairly PDF-based, the one that you, CNBC could link to. But um, indeed, I mean, one could say, I mean, um, you know, you have these central results, and you link the data, the code, um, the workflow, um, whatever you want, um, whatever you've done, um, the lab protocol um, to it, right. and, and make it reproducible, rerunnable. Right. Yeah, I mean, um, it's technique, it's both. Um, you know, people, the publishing companies need to adopt those changes 
because at the moment it is the kind of central conduit to these research results. Um, but in the end, um, it's also us, um, you know, who are working with the data, the software, etc. You need to push for these changes. I mean, that's why we are here also. <laughs> Zach, Megan, do you is this something that you see a call for within your um, your organizations, or is this? outsiders going, please, like, no, you open this, up. This is something we see a lot. And the biggest pushback we get is around software, usually. And I think the big cultural change there is just the science community has been a bit slow to sort of see software, really valuable software, as commensurate with publications. Right. Um, or really, really nice data sets, really nicely curated data sets that people can use for, you know, a wide range of science. So um, one of the things NASA just did, we updated our scientific information policy. And we actually put in there um, any NASA panel that's reviewing you know, proposals, um, people should um, view peer-reviewed data sets and peer-reviewed software as equal to publications, right? Um, so that's a big thing that we, you know, is now a requirement. Um, so hopefully that helps. But yeah, I think it's not just publications, right? In terms of reproducibility, software is becoming so important for reproducibility. And scientists, you know, are hesitant to share their software because they're not they're not computer scientists, right? We don't write great code <laughs> because <laughs> right. we weren't trained to do it, right? And right. so there, that's that's a big part of it. Um, another part of it is, you know, people scientists are often scared that they're going to spend years developing a code. They're going to have to make it openly available. Other scientists will come in, use it, put out publications quicker than they're able to, especially if they have to maintain that code, right? So I think the culture shift is sort of realizing that it's not just publications that are the output, it's software, it's also the data. Um, and those all, if all those things could be bundled together <laughs> um, as, a, as a scientific sort of like an endpoint, um, that would be my dream. Yeah. Yeah. Greg, Greg, so you, you uh, Picnic, Picnic is a storage provider. You basically, as I understand it, you can correct me, your job <laughs> is to go to NASA, CERN, other organizations and say, hey, we have this Falcon network, it's incredibly cheap, we have 20 exabytes of data, give us your data, yum, we want the data. <laughs> With these, the, this discussion in, in line, is it, do people have the data? Do people, do people have something that they can give you immediately? <laughs> or is part of your job kind of tidying up the data and making it usable? That's a good question. So um, I've been doing a lot of discovery work in this area, and, and one thing I would say, right, is, right, I was trying to figure out where does our technology fit, right? It's, it, um, I worked at the Intellectual Property Office at Berkeley Lab for a couple years. Uh, I was assessing inventions, uh, product market fit, trying to sell licenses of those technologies to companies, and what I learned is it's impossible to force a technology on somebody. Right. Right. It really, and there's actually a, a really well-known Steve Jobs um, YouTube video where he talks about the user experience. Yeah. And then the, te you know, the user experience will attract the tech. And so what I've been doing is just talking to people, um, you know, people uh, like Megan and Zach and Zunia, and it's like, okay, this is the tech, like, what do you think about this? And so what I've assessed in talking to, I talked to about 100 new people every quarter, so a lot of discussions, and the scientific community is really, I think, can benefit from the value propositions of our network. And what are those, right? So we use content addressing, um, instead of location-based addressing, this is better for accessibility. Uh, these content IDs or these CIDs create immutable records. We can track chain of custody so we can, as data is changed, we can always point back to the parent. These are very important things. Um, these immutable records are verified every day. This just creates a very resilient network that the, you know, the scientific, uh, the scientific uh, community can really benefit from. And then when you package it in a decentralized package, now you've removed that single point of failure Right. that web two single point of failure, and you have this very uh, robust network. And so kind of the way discovery goes is you talk to people and you're looking for people without talking about the tech to tell you what they're looking for. And Zunia had mentioned FAIR principles, and so FAIR means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And there's a great paper from 2016 about the FAIR principles, and it really details the user experience. Right? This is what scientists want from their data. And so, you know, because open science is a, gen, you know, is a general term. It's like eating healthy. <laughs> when have I eaten healthy? Um, and so if, you know, so if eating healthy, right, your diet is how you eat healthy. So open science, like FAIR, is how you, you know, you create open science such that when people find data sets, the metadata is there. They know where it came from. The algorithms, the data flows, not just the data itself, but like the whole package is there and it's understandable. And so I think that's, that's really important. I'm so excited you said that because um, uh, I just feel personally having like 
in the Falcon Foundation, we have to like be the people who sort of try and see all of these things and support everybody and make this a good thing. And like we're we're getting increasingly obsessed by usability. We just hired a, a great guy, Steph Magdalinsky, to work explicitly on making this stuff easier, which is why we coral and cross-examine all of you all the time. So, but pulling back to like whether you know the what are the challenges for open science as a movement in the future? Um, Megan, I know you work a lot with the machine learning uh, programs um, uh, within NASA and, and, and elsewhere. Um, one of the things that worries me about machine learning is, of course, it, it loves data. Um, GPT and all of these things are built on spidering public data. But then the processing, the training of those models is very centralized. Um, there aren't really that many companies even that can spend that kind of money on crunching that data and then producing a thing that can answer questions about everything else, which means it becomes more proprietary. It, it, is, this, is this a problem? Do you think machine learning is kind of um, ultimately opposed to the, to the benefits, of, the public benefits of open science? I don't, I don't necessarily think so. And, you know, I think when people think of machine learning and they have, you know, these big examples like, you know, GBT and things like that, those are huge data sets, right? And in science, we actually, you know, when you're using machine learning for science, um, our data sets are not that big. In fact, like the biggest issue when trying to apply machine learning to science is that you're, you run up to the issue if you don't have enough data right. often, right, to answer the question you're trying to answer. So, you know, I think it, the computationally, a lot of the projects I've seen, you know, there can be valuable machine learning projects for science that don't actually require a lot of computation. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, you know, agencies like NASA um, or the NSF, you know, we have our own computing facilities. And when people apply for grants with us, they can say, I would like time on the high end computing computers. And at least at NASA, you know, that's a separate, you're not paying for that time if you are awarded time to do work. Um, through NASA grants, you can use as, you know, within reason, you can use as much as the high-end computing time as you want. So those resources are available um, to people getting funding from us, yeah. So could you imagine an environment, a, a future where, as you, you talked about citizen science, right, and, and public data, that you could have public computation and citizen computation where people could use the CERN supercomputers? You yep. don't have to say yes. <laughs> it's not. A... Uh, yes, but. Right, okay. right. Uh, we are, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm worried about, in fact, is that, that issue of um, how to get the compute and the storage to the, to the world so that they could, they could use it without opening it up for abuse, right? You can't oh, just right. offer someone a whole bunch of compute and then they go away and mine Bitcoin, which was a famous example oh, right, of what's okay. system, right? Um, so you have to rein that in a little bit and make sure that, that you've understood what they're, what they're doing. But yeah, the, the other thing that we do and have done is letting some people sort of into our collaboration and say, come work with us. We know you want to do this. It's, it seems very interesting and important, but just come do it internally with us. We have computing resources. We can help um, make this public afterwards, um, but we'll make sure that you're speaking the right language when you do so and that you um, pass all of the scrutiny that our experiment applies to all of its, its results. And then we do you know, take a neural network and make the network public mm. so that if someone wishes to come along and check it out, they, they can do that. So Zach, this, this brings me to another uh, question I had, which is, so you work with, with um, uh, uh, Greg and others to put data, um, the Atlas data, uh, onto, onto the Filecoin network. Now, uh, f f explain to me, <laughs> what, what was that data? I mean, I, I was involved in saying, yes, this looks like good data. But I have to admit, I was doing that going, I'm not an astrophysicist, <laughs> I'm not sure what, what, does, what is this data useful for? Yeah, so as I explained, Atlas, you can think of as a camera taking pictures of particle collisions. Uh, and the data set that we're storing is a huge reduction of those pictures. So we don't, unlike NASA, you, you have the best pictures. I'm always <laughs> jealous. Um, we reduce those to the points where you say, out of this collision came an electron in that direction and a proton in that direction and so on. Uh, and someone coming along afterwards can reconstruct what was, what was going on in that event. So we have a very simplified uh, view of how that event looked. 
and to someone who understands even a little bit about particle physics, you don't have to have a PhD, um, can look at some of those events and say, okay, what was probably going on in this collision? Is this interesting or not? Uh, and you know, test a model, test our understanding of the universe with some of those data. So do you see the functions here of open science being to sort of um, show you're working so other people can check that you've come to the same conclusions? Or do you anticipate other people being able to make new discoveries or build new new research based on that data? Both, uh, certainly. But I'll and uh, I think the beauty of uh, open science is that we don't necessarily need to know. Right, um, right. <laughs> you know, uh, we put it out there and then people can, you know, in theory, combine it with, you know, data from NASA and ours that we put out there and um, do, um, you know, use it for machine learning or um, whatever and right. um, exploit it um, as they see fit. Um, yeah. I, th I think that's the beauty, actually. Because, and uh, if, if people do want to play around with data, that we have a website, the Falcon have a website called datasets.filecoin.io, I believe. Um, and you can just download, we have uh, genomics data, we have uh, um, dumps of all of Wikipedia, we have a, a lot of stuff that you can just download for, for free. So it's not so much an advert because it's yeah, we free. we have the same but, at CERN. So oh, well, there you go. At and, <laughs> and, and you have <laughs> ftp.nasa.gov, <laughs> right? Well, we all have data for free. You can take it if you want. So, yeah, here, if I may, um, you yeah. know, it's not necessarily, um, I think, the, the free as in doesn't cost, but um, also the licensing, et cetera, that's extremely crucial here. Right, um, right. You know, relating also to the uh, origins of open source, et cetera, um, because we are very liberal, um, all of us, I think, when it comes to licensing. So we practically put it into the public domain. I yeah. Think it's, so that's really important. Sorry. Again, I think this is a challenge for both uh, uh, us at the Falcon Foundation, where we're trying to encourage more, more data, and also when we're, uh, um, uh, Greg and other storage providers are working on... Uh, uh, bringing people on, so uh, you, you can store data privately on the network, like just like other ones. But but our tendency is to store, uh, our preference in many ways is to store public data. Greg, Greg, do you hear a problem where you go and say to to people, well, we're going to make this public, and then people get a little bit scared and say, well, it's open, but I'm not sure I want it to be that open. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, most definitely. I mean, sometimes. Um, the data can be open, but it's really not usable, right? Mm -hmm. That's a key thing. It's like, yeah, you can download this, but there's good luck with trying to do something with this. Right. And so I think that's what you know Zach was talking about. You know, just th that's the whole usable part of you right. know. Of, and, uh, and, and, and Megan also with the sort of shame version of it, right? Where you go and ask for the data, and people go, I, I, I don't want you to see how messy yeah. it is, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. But um, just back to the challenges, though, because I, I think it's important to talk about some of the challenges. Um, just back to the, some of the, the discovery work that I've done is a very common theme in, in the science world is folks are preparing for about a thousand x increase in data creation in the next five or so years, and that's worth repeating. It's a thousand x in the next five or so years, and we look at hard drives like, well, where are we going to put all this data? So in the last 20 years, hard drives capacity has increased by about a thousand x tens of gigabytes to tens of terabytes. So we'll just need to accelerate that by about a factor of three to four. Um, so hopefully Seagate's listening. Um, and then um, also network bandwidth, we mentioned that before. I mean, right. there was a time when Netflix, you know, <laughs> sent DVDs around. I mean, they don't do that so much anymore. Uh, there's a reason for that. And so, the, you know, the network bandwidth is increasing, but we're gonna have to have some patience there. And then the other thing that I see, and, and this is a big difference, I'd say, from like, you know, the blockchain community versus the scientific community. The scientific community is very patient. And I'll say one of our <laughs> challenges on the blockchain side might be patience, right? Um, I've worked for NASA. I've done these things. I think everyone's going to agree, right? It's a patient game to play. The blockchain world is known for being very quick and very fast. And so I think we're going to have to chill out a bit. You know, <laughs> you know, we have, you know, we're playing the long game here. And so... I think uh, maybe I can take the action for you know for our community to kind of impress upon that patience and and uh, you know and work with, you know work with people like this and as long as we're kind of keeping our eye on the long game I think we'll be okay but that is a bit of a of a concern for me is the patience aspect uh, on our side of the table. 
So let's talk a little bit about this, the, the, the literal amounts of data that are now being produced. Like, so Zach, we were, again, we were talking in, in, in the cream room earlier, and you just threw away, you just said, well, we're putting this much data, we're putting these petabytes, which is thousands of terabytes, just to be clear. But like, actually, the real data is, like, what did you say, 20 it, exabytes? It'll be about 20 exabytes. Our experiment's a long lifetime. We, we're going to run until 2040. Uh, and over that time, yeah, we'll have tens of exabytes of data that we collect. And you know, as we've talked about, that we, we could make that public in principle 20 years from now maybe, um, but of what use is it? Right, is that right. really something that the, the public can intelligently digest in some helpful way? So that's one of the reasons why the, the public version of those data are you know, a thousand times smaller. We pre-digest them into something that we think is useful to the community and can be useful to the community. And I think one thing that we often overlook is exactly how much effort is required to then support that open data. Because open data without some kind of open software is useless. You, you need software to read it, to understand the format, and so on. And we have a ton of software that's been written to look at those data and, and manipulate them in various ways and making sure that those are open and then supported by people so someone has an email address where they can ask for help understanding these 10 petabytes becomes really really important megan like we're, we're really at the the just such an exciting moment in ex, exoplanet science and exo and planetary science right we're we, i mean I, as far as i understand we're expecting if not a lot of data, then certainly new and novel data. Does NASA, with its mission to educate as well as to explore, uh, are you thinking a lot about like what data should we, how do we parcel this? How do we spread this around the world? Yeah, and I think one of the things that's talked about a lot is this analysis ready data, right? How do you get these data sets? Because you know, if you ever looked at data that came down from a spacecraft, you right, it's it's not pretty, right? There's a lot that goes into, you know, you see these pretty pictures from JWST or, you know, things orbiting like Saturn and, and Jupiter, you see these beautiful photos, but you know, when they come down, they're black and white, right? And we combine them and uh, do false coloring and things like that. Um, but, you know, even getting a data set light curves down from the Kepler spacecraft, for example, those are all images and you have to extract the light curves and, you know, put it online where then a citizen scientist could come along and use it. So there's a lot of steps in between, but trying to get these data sets, these analysis ready data sets out there, it takes a lot of work and a lot of documentation to do it. So we're still trying to figure out, you know, identify data sets where they should be brought to that level. Um, and then identify the ones that you know we think are going to be most useful to the science community, to citizen scientists, things like that. So NASA is starting to do that, um, especially in the planetary science division. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely something that we're we're working on and trying to still trying to figure out how to do it in the best way. Yeah. So I didn't put this on the list of questions, so you're allowed to go. Oh, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, in, the, in our final sort of three minutes, um, uh, what, what data sets are you looking forward to <laughs> in the next few years? What's the, what's the huge amount of data that you're like, no, bring, bring it on. We really want to see this and, and process this. Um, so actually, so one of, the one of the challenges with open science, right, is the heterogeneity of data, especially at NASA. So Sorry, the... The heterogeneity of data. So, you know, there are images, there are spectra, that kind of thing. In the planetary science division, the other thing that we have to deal with is our physical samples. Um, and how to deal with that. So I'm, I do, I work on the Mars sample return missions. We're bringing back samples from Mars, right? Uh -huh. And we have to put them in cur curation facilities and things like that. Um, and yeah, trying to figure out how to bring that kind of different data into the open science world is gonna be very interesting, but don't have to worry about that until 2030, so. <laughs> uh, uh, and Zach, what's, what's the, what, what data is gonna be coming out of CERN in the next 20 years that has people excited? The next big step for us is there's we're we're in a run right now, which will run to 2025, and then we have a three-year shutdown where we upgrade the accelerator and the detectors oh, to wow. be able to run at five or ten times higher rate. Uh, we'll be collecting ten times more images at the same time, uh, so it's going to be an explosion at that point. And all our models say, you know, we're we're pushing the boundaries as it is and preparing for that huge jump that will come in 2029 is what's on all of our minds. Right. And Sunyad, what are you, are you looking forward to? What's your prediction for 
reproducible builds and like what 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 will you hope to see in the next 10 years um more exploitation of our data actually um more so exploitation oh more data. use of it right yeah. right, uh, right i mean you know we are making good use of it <laughs> um right. and um, i mean the reason also why we are here i think is um, you know we would want to tell everyone hey you know our stuff is out there um, you know, are you interested in it? And I mean, because we have all this data science expertise, et cetera, um, coming with it. So, um, you know, not only do open science, but, you know, also more open collaboration and, um, and this kind of stuff to see, um, you know, how else could it be useful? And uh, I'm looking forward for the unexpected. <laughs> That's my wish. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, what data sets are you, are you on the hunt for to put onto the Filecoin network? Maybe that's Maybe that's secret, I don't know. Um, <laughs> it is a secret, um, oh. I'm, no, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, you know, to me, I'm kind of agnostic to the data set, but what I'm excited about is to see when we execute this open tech, open science tech stack and we really can get this immutable data out and, and, um, and we get it to the corners of the world and some kid that was born in some you know, rough situation comes across a computer and an internet connection and an open science data set and discovers something that none of us could have discovered. I wanna meet that kid. So, well, here's to the unexpected. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. That was a great conversation. Um, so, uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all my chance. <laughs> thank you all so much. And Danny, my gosh, such great energy on stage. I, well, <laughs> thank you so thank you. much. I'm and to your panelists. Thank you. And to make sure that everyone here has all the energy, we're now going to take a short break. Um, but we will be back at 1.15 with more amazing guests. So please do remember to eat, but then come back. Thank you so much, everyone.